week on a very special spooky Halloween fancy dress episode of Badger Pod Nerdcast. The Badgers discuss The Matrix. Orgasmo. And Anita Sarkees is... Tell us about your adventures in Normal People Land. Oh gosh, Normal People yes. Land. That's so hard, you guys. Why are you, <laughs> why are you gonna be? <laughs> no, um, but uh, but yeah, I did have an adventure. I was able to go on one of the more uh, involved Gamergate streams. I met a lot of people, and I did meet uh, Aaron Gioni, and he's a very nice, sort of down to earth kind of guy. So the idea that these folks are saying that he's like this horrible person who's plotting to have revenge against his girlfriend is kind of ridiculous. He's just really down to earth, very, very nice. It's just his entire persona. You would never think to yourself that this is somebody who would try and act out of spite. So and that's... he's, uh, he's uh, the boyfriend of uh, Zoe Quinn? Yeah, yeah he, the ex-boyfriend, yes. Uh, the one who wrote the Zoe post. Um, it was a very nice... I think it was very constructive. I think a lot of ground was covered. In fact, I would... I would suggest that anybody who really wants to, you know, create some real change in the Gamergate situation, I think that the conversations that are taking place in Oliver Campbell, sorry, Oliver Campbell's stream, I think they are some of the best that we're seeing because people are being frank. People who have different views are able to have adult discussions, and that is really what will change things here. I mean, while things are really popular with the mundane match streams and, you know, Internet Aristocrat and King of Pole, those people, you know, they they do their thing. But if we're really wanting to be constructive, these, you know, these conversations need to continue. Yeah, well, tell us a bit more about the, uh, the event, like, the, the, the podcast. I mean, you, you said to me that there was mostly... Uh, well, there was a, a feminist therapist on, and some people who were neutral. And most well, of- they were they were all very uh, gender equity minded feminists. I think with I don't know where Aaron lies on that spectrum, but he seems pretty pretty reasonable. Um, they they're very. I, I would say that our our ideas of what needs to happen for for men and boys and just people in general are pretty much in line. I. I think we might disagree in how we pursue those things, but I think we are at the position where we both acknowledge that these problems exist for both sexes, and those are the kinds of discussions that need to take place. So that you know, it's it's some good it's some good stuff. <laughs> yeah, why don't you give us a, a a heads up on where we can find this podcast that you? Are oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, oh, sorry, I would, I would actually have to go. Oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Hold on. I'd have to go through. You know what? Don't, don't worry about it. Um, the I'll podcast, pop it. Rachel Edwards with the normal people. Uh, we'll pop <laughs> it in the low bar link. Uh, you'll, Mike, you yeah. can. Yeah, we'll pop that into the low bar link later. I was probably not on my game. I was so nervous because these are people I, I'd only seen on streams, and they're they're really nice and down to earth, but I, you know, me and my anxiety sort of, <laughs> sort of kicks in. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. No, worry about it. Worry about it. Oh, gosh. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. So we need to get back on topic. I guess we can start going, traveling along the topics. But if we're going to go talk about Gamergate just mildly, um, Christina Hoff Summers was interviewed by MSNBC, and that was a lot, a big, it was kind of a big deal. Um, but it was very obvious that the interviewer was a little bit adverse to her. It was sort of... Uh, you could tell that she wasn't she she's not used to having to deal with that but she was tripped up a little bit because he was trying to approach her in that way that these people in MSNBC and all these other so- folks the very biased ones t- try to lead the people in these interviews right. and try to push it back to to sexism so it was you know she wasn't used to that it was you, you could tell that, but, you know, I think she did as good as she could do. I think she did a good job anyway, regardless of that. Um, but, well, I'm but sure yeah. she's used to dealing with, like, really hostile 
interviewers? A lot of stuff has been happening as well. Um, from what we're hearing, Amazon is probably f going to pull from Gawker pretty soon. And also, uh, I'm trying to think of the other places that have recently pulled. And it it's 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 happening, you guys. It's But the thing, thing is, is that we have to wonder what's going to be something that resembles a victory. What resembles victory for us? We need we need to know what that looks like so that we know when we get there. And I think what's what's going to be seen is that, you know, a lot of people are making their own sites, these people who believe um, that we need to have a fair and balanced look at the industry and need to operate on these ethics. Those those sites are are emerging. But also we're going to see it in that sort of independent market because now people can find information from YouTubers and a lot, of, a lot of people are just destroying the game journalism industry. By the time this is over, there may not be one to speak of. So it, it's hard to know where, what's going to happen next or what we can well, count as a victory. You know what I think you guys should count as a victory? When the people who are creating content that you purchase respect you as a consumer body and don't start trying to push an agenda that you are... Um, Philistines who need to be slapped around. Yeah. And Gawker is, it's kind of going down in flames. It's sort of self-destructing in front of our eyes. Yay! It's, yeah, they need to go. <laughs> yeah, the thing about it is, is these people have been corrupt even before now. And what's happening, it's not going to completely go away. It is very much this big animal. We're going to defund it. It's going to be a shadow of its former self. But it's still going to be out there lurking in the shadows like Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Just sort mm -hmm. of like, precious. You know, My sort precious. Of. <laughs> My precious. Ugh. Well, now we have to take down uh, Vice. And... Uh, well, they've actually started um, having issues with by some people, you know, I, I don't know about that. Um, I think they might have published a balanced article, so it's sort of a kind of a hit and miss sort of thing with them. It's, it's difficult to know where they stand on this because on the one hand, they have a tendency to support people who are revolting against the system, but at the same time, they... There's uh, some of them believe that this is sort of an anti-feminist kind of deal, and if they believe that for a moment, they're not going to support it fully. They don't realize <laughs> feminism is the system, uh, well, or at most... least it owns the system. <clears throat> well, from their perspective, and, and this is just something I've, I've noticed, and I'm not going to go on for too long, but it's they they don't see it that way. They a lot of the people who are at least at, at least the feminists we're talking about, we're talking about the social justice types. They don't realize that what they've constructed is not sort of a little guy against the big whole world. They are the big whole world. They are the big, you know, monstrous thing. They they think okay, well if I if I do one or two things wrong that you know may be unethical to get ahead, that's okay because I'm fighting against the patriarchy. And, you know, these little things add up. These little bits of corruption, they all add up until you become the monster that you say that you're against. But didn't exist in the first place, but anyway. Yeah, yeah exactly. They, the, the real monster is sort of, you know, people acting that way in the first place. People in positions of power acting in corrupt ways and not taking responsibility for their actions. And through those actions, they're screwing everybody over. That's... Okay, so we just had a blue moon happen. James wants to speak. James. Yeah. Yes. And a few, a few of these social justice warriors, the feminists in particular, have been flipping the narrative when it comes to dealing with their normal political demographic. Um. It used to be that feminism and the left, this included leftist men, got along and colluded fairly well together. But over the last couple of years, I've noticed more and more that the feminists have been withdrawing that support away from uh, 
the left of center politics if men are also involved in the decision making process. How nice of them. This is, yeah, so we're actually looking at something, a new division beginning to happen in this way. It is, it is being drawn more so along sexist lines in, in the way the radical feminists have been wanting it to be all along than it ever was before. Yeah, and and that's the thing that I've been seeing. If it's egalitarian, if it's not liberal enough, they will consider it to be conservative. And if you're so far left that everything else seems conservative by comparison, even other liberals, that's... You get to this sort of place of ridiculousness, but I think we've gone on too long about this. I've, I've actually seen it go almost full circle. They go so far left, they're right. Like the mm-hmm. Pac-Man door? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, far, so far left that you've, you've gone straight into fascism. You're just, yeah. yeah. Can we talk about Twitch and what they've done with, uh, with their streams and how they've uh, changed it so you can't actually wear suggestive clothing? Oh, I what didn't do you know about that. You didn't know about that? Oh, okay, um... Ryan, take it away. Yeah, uh, so I just learned that Twitch passed a new, uh, like, basically they changed their user um, license agreement, and they they did, like, this very flowery, well-spoken thing, you know, very cautious about how they approached it, basically saying that um, Twitch, it's not appropriate to wear, uh, you know, revealing clothing or be topless, and this is, like, whether you're male or female, doesn't matter, Um and they want it because Twitch was, from the beginning, it was all about streaming games. And basically what had happened in the culture of Twitch was you had this thing where there were um, people would stream games, like they'd be playing League of Legends or something. And people would tune into Twitch to watch high-level play. And then some people who were streaming would um, put like a you know, green screen themselves into the, into the shot so you can get like their reaction and stuff or while they chat with people. And as a result of at first, that's what it was. So you might have like some guy playing League of Legends and he'd be in the corner and he might react to what was happening or maybe some horror game or whatever, you know. But then uh, some female players started doing that. But what they would do is they would wear bikini tops or they would wear, you know, really revealing clothing. And, and, they, and then they would even invert the screens so that their screen the, the, the shot of them would be the really big shot and the gameplay one would be like the little tiny one in the corner. And um, I guess for, for Twitch, that was just sort of getting away from what their intentions were. I mean, it got to the point where these uh, female users, mostly, there was a couple of male users that were doing it too. Like there was this one that was a gay man and he would, he would do it, but he was, he was um, parroting the female users and he would go in there with no shirt on and he would act really flamboyant, but it was all a joke. And he would even exercise before the, the stream would begin because there were female users that would do a dance or they would do like a strip tease or they would do aerobics and then they'd start playing the game. And I guess stream felt, I mean Twitch rather, felt that that was getting away from what their goal was uh, because that's not what it was about. So they, they changed their, um, they, they basically changed their, you know, their rules on that. And not, this just was announced today. But um, I, personally, I don't really care what people, you know, do with their streaming or whatever. But I'm, I'm, I eagerly await the backlash from uh, both po- sex positive and sex negative feminists about this, this issue. So, right. right, this keeps happening. Right, girls come along, flaunt their sexy bits because they can, because there's an open market for it. And then feminists see it and go, these girls are being exploited. And then they complain until Twitch does something about it. Then when Twitch have done something about it, other feminists complain that it's her buddy, her choice, and they're being oppressed by Twitch in their puritanical dinosaur ways. It's like (laughs) feminists always form two polar satellites around an object so they can orbit around it, spewing jet streams of bullshit at it and never seeing each other. (laughs) Yeah. Right? (laughs) Well, you know, I, I 
I actually, I actually used to be a part of the uh, the larger community attached to Twitch, which was um, they had Justin TV, and then as an extension of that, there was Twitch. But Twitch ended up being the thing that was uh, the company that was bought, and Justin TV ceased to exist after that. So I think a lot of the people who were previously using the streaming service of Justin TV then went over to Twitch. And, yeah, there was a lot of craziness going on in just the, the Justin TV crowd. I'm they got into sure. a lot of trouble. Um, it wasn't Wait, necessarily... Hmm? Um, Hannah's uh, trying to get in there, so... I'm oh, sorry, sorry. sorry about that. Uh, this is just going to be really short. I said the difference between girl gamers and gamers who happen to be girls... And then you have the girl gamers. Don't look at me, or don't don't treat me differently because I'm not I'm a girl. Don't treat me differently because I'm a girl. Don't treat me differently because I'm a girl. Look at my boobs. And, and then you just have the, the 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 girl who happens to be a gamer, or the gamer who happens to be a girl who's in there playing. And and I'm I'm sure there are going to be plenty of women offended on both sides of this. Um, and none of them are going to be offended on behalf of the game or or gameplay or just relaxing and having a pastime it they're going to make it about girls it's going to stop being about the site and games and be becoming about girls again of course it's well yeah about girls well speaking of this this is a nice tie into another topic which i promised i would mention but there apparently a cosplayer uh decided that she was going to uh crowdfund funding her boom job her boob job to you know get breast augmentation <laughs> On GoFundMe. That's what. What are your thoughts on that, guys? <laughs> uh, okay. Interesting. Uh, I, I guess if people want to pay for it, there well, there will. are people selling ads on their foreheads in tattoo form and their arms and their backs and their thighs and whatever else. There's a chick that has sold ad space tattoo ad space on her boobs. I see nothing wrong with this. As long as she upholds her into the deal and never at any point pretends that this is in any way oppressing her. Yeah, as long as she says, well, or or, you know the thing that she could do would be like, okay, I've got this boob job, so now I will share it with all of my my, uh, my funders. Now they get to see the boob job. Don't don't treat me different because I'm a girl. Look at my boobs! Um, (laughs) I mean, are they allowed to do that kind of like pornographic adult material type thing? Not on Twitch. No, no, not on Twitch. This isn't on Twitch. This is, um, this has to do with an entirely different situation. Oh, no, I mean, but she's, she's, she does, she's doing a crowdfunder. Is she doing a crowdfunder through a platform? Uh, yeah, through GoFundMe. Yeah, is is that, are you allowed to crowdfund for X-rated stuff? Well, I don't know, and, and and it's she's a cosplayer, so technically, I don't think it would be X-rated, but if she wanted to give her, I don't know, the people who are funding her boob job, I don't know, um, a peak, I don't know if that's, I don't think that that's what she's going to do, though. Well, if I donate, <laughs> if I donate to a museum, I want to be able to see the, uh, you know, the, um, the displays, I'm just saying. Well, I mean, you're like, <laughs> well, I paid for it, shit. Well, uh, not me. I haven't actually given, but you know, I wouldn't. I but I don't know. But if it, yeah, it's wow. It's it's sort of irrelevant. I think. I mean, oh really my gosh, the, the 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 comments are things like "I love titties." <laughs> okay, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Actually... She's probably gonna get millions. Yeah. Well, hopefully. No. And she's she only got um she's she's received one thousand eight hundred and thirty five of four thousand three hundred. She's she's gonna get enough money to make herself like a cat. She's gonna have like six. Oh my like, gosh! She did, oh, oh my gosh! You guys um <laughs> she, she didn't raise. I don't think she raised enough. I think I think it turns out she didn't raise enough because like it was um. It says this much was raised by twenty six people in twenty six days. I don't know how much she needed for the augmentation, but. I guess men aren't as um, misogynistic as uh, they, she thought they were. Yeah. Well, I mean, because they aren't fulfilling her dreams. You know, so... <laughs> maybe, kind of uh, remember, yeah, two are. rotating satellites spewing bullshit, no matter what men do, they're wrong and women are victims. So... Yeah, well, you know... Hurts. Wow, yeah, these horrible shitlords, they didn't pay for her boob job. <laughs> yeah, either, way, they're, either way, they're misogynist, right? 
Okay, let's. All right, let's... all right. Next topic. Next topic. A real topic. Let's go. <laughs> uh, are we going for Orgasmo, uh, The Matrix, or uh, Anita? Do you want to get Anita off the table? Because that's no. Nice. Let's, let's leave Anita for the end. Because, because you know, it. it... We got to bookend it with that shit. Yeah, it's got to be bookended. Let's do like Orgasmo. I'm not talking to Anita at what all. Mix yeah, my that, is... that would be just a tragedy, but we, we can take that risk. Yeah, we can. We can definitely do that. Um, so, yeah, let's let's go for Orgasmo. Oh, gosh, Orgasmo. Wait, uh, um, yeah, 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 I got it. Okay, yeah, I got Crystal it. got it. Yeah. Okay. So, Orgasmo. Two Mormon men head out on their mission to L.A. There, they stumble across a porn producer's house... And when he sends his security to dispose of them, is shocked to find a skilled martial artist among the missionaries. Pleasantly surprised, the porn director, Max Orbison, baits Joseph Young, the Mormon martial artist, to be in his porno to the tune of a very high paying paycheck. Joseph Young, who wants to give his fiance her dream wedding at the temple in Utah, which is very expensive, takes the job despite cognitive dissonance and sign from God. His journey in the porn industry includes making friends with his co-worker Chota Boy. The two take turn into being uh, the two turn into being actual superheroes with the power of orgasm at the tip of Chota Boy's invention. Joseph Young has to keep facing his job to please has to face keeping his job to please his fiance or losing his fiance to keep his job. I love Orgasmo too. It's one of my favorite movies. I haven't watched in a while, but God, I love that movie. It's freaking hilarious. Okay, okay, I'll I'll, I'll show you what I had in terms of, rev of review of pretty much the section that you had. Orgasmo is a movie about a Mormon who becomes a superhero porn star. <laughs> Just from that pitch, it pretty much writes itself. And yeah. it delivers because it's it's a Trey Parker vehicle for those of you who haven't heard of the film, so you can expect silliness, and it's an early Trey Parker, so you can expect goodness, and there is something weirdly timeless about it. It wouldn't look out of place if it was made fifteen years before or after, and it was made in the nineties, so it has a lot to say about porn. <laughs> porn w was a different beast in the nineties. It was abundant, but it was still <laughs> precious. <laughs> Right. It, it's, it's a movie that does in its own subtle way make you wonder what it's like to be a porn star and how easy it is to become a porn star and how rewarding it really is because well men get the shit beaten out of them almost constantly throughout this movie <laughs> I'm not going Sarkeesian they also get shot at with an orgasmo ray which in the spirit of this stuff pretty much writing itself causes the target to have an orgasm hence the superhero part <clears throat> And I don't think it's too Sarkeesian to see that as a subtle allegory for something. I don't know. Especially considering, to my memory, very few, if not no, women are ever shot with this device in the movie. I can't help but wonder that's, if there's a censorious reason for that. Is there, is there... Oh, there is one. Shit. Is there? There's an old... They actually shoot the old lady and a couple of other oh, women. Yeah. Oh, shit, yeah. But, it, yeah. You know, well, it's just mainly shot at men, though, isn't it? What? Um... One of them was a woman who uh, was using a walker, and she ended up humping the walker. Oh, yeah. shit, yeah. But it's never yeah, used on any movie. female porn stars or any such uh, subjects in the movie, you know, the people with Women with to... sexual power, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's used on pretty much every guy in, in the... In the <laughs> it comes across it, yeah. So to speak... Are you done? Yeah. Are, are you done? Oh, I was Mike? done ages ago. I'm, I've been rambling for like a minute. Oh, I, I didn't know whether you were reading off of your page or. <laughs> I, could... no, I, I transitioned into rambling. Did you see that? Oh, no, you did. Well, you oh, that's this right. The cop. Smooth. Yes. I forgot about the cop. Yeah, you have a very oh. smooth, smooth transition into <laughs> rambling there. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so yes, there were there were women who, who were shot with the ray. But, the, but there is a. That does kind of make a commentary, though, that people are uh, completely disabled by the pursuit of orgasm. <laughs> and here and your main character is somebody who is pursuing sex whether he you know he he loves his his bride but if he he's a good mormon boy he he's never had sex in his life and the idea of um doing these kinds of things with people he doesn't feel you know feelings for if he feels is morally wrong but he's willing to go through all these things 
for the pursuit of sex with the woman he loves. So it's they're, they're really kind of uprooting their lives and sort of a detriment in the pursuit of sex. And there's a very interesting moment in the movie where they've captured his girlfriend and they're having a conversation about a very mild conversation, uh, weird, it, it's, it's sort of spontaneous conversation about whether or not it's sexism or whether or not people are being exploited or who's really being exploited in the porn industry. Mm. But it all, it all, but then it goes back to, um, do you want to, uh, before we get, yeah, yeah, Mike, uh, Mike, oh. you want to read that? Did, did uh, oh shit, that? that, oh, uh, that needs oh, three people know. to read it. I, can, uh, oh, oh. I, I got it right here. I got it right oh. here. Okay, That's okay. It. Has anyone else got it up right here? I, I got oh. it. I got it. I can take Wait, it. It needs okay. three people. Well, Wait, I'll, I'll do the next one. No, it, it just needs one person with lots of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, I'll, right. Do, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do X, you do Y, and then I'll do Z as well. Right, right. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do an, an excerpt from from Orgasmo, and I, I want I want you, I want you all to see if you can spot the feminist. Okay, <clears throat> men are equally degraded in pornographic films. Men are always in positions of power. Yeah. <laughs> the the men are the ones who want the product so bad. They're the victims. Well, then it exploits men by exploiting women. Can't you see? Hence, it exploits people. Oh, shut up! I do what I do and I make a lot of money and I don't give a shit what I do to people because they are all idiots! <laughs> now, okay. if you answered the last character, congratulations, you have a sense of humor. If you're annoyed right now, but you still get the joke, you have a sense of humor, you just don't like having it. <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing that X is the uh, is the feminist. No, wait, not X. Oh, the Z Z. Sorry, Z Z Z. Yeah, bro. the one who comes in and says, "Shut up, you're all idiots." Oh, really? I knew it wouldn't work. <clears throat> the one with the emotional <laughs> response, basically. It's just it's the one just who comes in at the end and says, "Fuck you guys, I do this for the money, and I don't give a shit because you're all idiots." Hmm. Uh, the guy, the guy, the, the the main villain in it, the the guy who's just completely evil for no reason whatsoever. The the main pawn, uh, Ron show. Jeremy. He's no no no. Ron Jeremy was actually oh, no. uh, two of the X lines in that. Yes oddly yes. Oddly yes. enough. <laughs> can we untangle this spaghetti a bit? So the nope, feminine. I don't think we can. <laughs> but spaghetti is falling out of my pockets, Allison. What pockets? No, no. Never, never mind, never mind. Some people will, yeah, will at home will have gotten that joke. <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't hear. I only heard like no, um, no, sorry. at the end of the joke. My so spaghetti. Run it by me again, see if I get it. Run it by me again. Just, just sl slap no, it on me. It's a, it, no, it's a, it's an inside meme thing. Spaghetti in pockets. Don't, it, I, you know what? Don't, don't. If I have to explain it, it's not gonna. No, it's no, not gonna no. I'm just asking you to tell me it because I didn't. I said, but the I said, but the the spaghetti was in my pocket. It just fell out of my pockets, Alice, and we can't tangle it. Untangle it. It just fell out of my pockets. We can oh. untangle it. We can untangle it. No, we can't. Let's go on. So the spaghetti. No, uh, oh, we, all right, all right, but um, flailing place. So I think Crystal was. Crystal yes. is right. Go Crystal. Go Crystal. Go Crystal. We're handing you a plate of spaghetti. Do something with it. So, back to Orgasmo. <laughs> Away from the plate of spaghetti of Orgasmo. Um, I love this movie. It's freaking hilarious. I love how uh, it's, it's like the sexuality is just played with a lot. Um, so I found it really fun. And I'm sure so many people would have found it so incredibly offensive. Because it really is set out to be incredibly offensive to as many people as possible. But I think that's what's so fun about it, too. But it's interesting is it shows what, you know, the main character, the poor guy, he's, you know, the only reason he becomes a porn star is to please his fiance because she wants this extravagant wedding at in, you know, in Utah. And so he does what he wouldn't normally do to make sure she's happy. And then at some point when she finds out she has zero compassion for the fact that he went through all of this to please her, to make her happy, because all she could talk about is the wedding, the wedding, is 
you know, and, you know, pretty much put him as, I mean, she loved him, but at the same time, it was like the wedding, the wedding was more important than him, it seemed like. And then so at, when she finds out, when she first finds out, she has like zero compassion for him. I'm leaving you. I mean, here's this guy going through hoops, going against everything that he's been raised to be for her. And then she she doesn't get it. I mean, in the end, she she gets it. But, you know, I, I just found that part like, I was like, oh, that's that's obnoxious. Mm. Yeah. It is sort of, uh, but it's like a really common theme, it seems, in romantic comedies. That right. a guy has to sacrifice something in order to be worthy of the woman. Um, I remember in particular there was some sort of insipid romantic comedy that involved baseball. Um, and for some reason the guy was supposed to stop touring with these super fans that he would tour with. And if he did that, he, that was showing his love to her and then that made him worthy. And then she realized, mm -hmm. oh, that's a stupid thing to ask. But not before he was showed he was willing to do it. And it's like... Well, most plots are about sort of the main character overcoming some kind of uh, hardship, and often that hardship is shame. And it's often about a man overcoming the, the shame in order to do this, and that's why uh, the uh, heroine, I might call it in this, in, in this case, um, orientates to that particular mission yeah, but, to but get over the shame of, of being a pawn star. Yeah, but the thing is that it's... Um, I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's normal. <laughs> is it really getting over the shame? Because in in some cases, it's like you, you have to be shamed by the woman into doing something in particular to earn your right to I don't know access to her. Right. Yeah. Well, he he fell into this particular thing and had to lie to her. You know, he told her it was death of a salesman and, and such. Yeah, but in this case, which, which is a, a further abstraction of the of the shame uh, uh, tree, I suppose. Yeah, but. Let's 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 go to the shame tree. Um, and We're shame, already at the shame tree. She <laughs> got the shame fruit. On the one hand, you have the shame of being a porn star because he's a Mormon. But on the other hand, you have the shame of not being able to provide the wedding that his fiance wants. Yeah. And in the end, does he actually become a person that transcends shame, or does it just fall into his lap that everybody's happy? He um he doesn't transcend shame to be honest. Because he's still he's still really very much a traditionalist. So he, even though he went through all this stuff, he still finds those things to be morally wrong, and he just went back to doing things that he originally found to be morally correct. It's a lot like train spotting in a way. So it's <laughs> it's like I've defied my morals, and then I'm just going to go back to those morals, even though they are completely and utterly ridiculous, and even though I'm going through all this crap just to have access to a vagina. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not even just to have acts. Let's be fair. I mean, he's probably in love with her in some sense of the word. Well, yes, yes, but I'm saying it's it, it's not so easy that they can just be in love and then just have sex. It's You have to go through this elaborate ritual before you can have sex. Well, th th what I'm getting at is that if he was actually transcending shame, wouldn't he have gotten over his aversion to actually having porn? I don't know, but I mean, even if he wanted to uphold, yeah, his morals, he, he, did, he didn't have a no. He didn't have a he didn't have a um, he didn't overcome this aversion to porn by the end. He's still totally disgusted by it. Yeah, still using the stunt cocks. Yep. Yeah, still using the stunt cocks. Still, you know, not. Um, yeah, he, he's he's still sort of disgusted by, it, but you know, and he has no issues using sex to defeat other people, and that's kind of the whole message of the story if you think about it. It's that sex is probably one of the most powerful things on the planet and that it can pretty much defeat anybody and anybody can use it for their own means. Even to control Mormons. People. Yes. Like even, Lacey Green. <laughs> even Mormons. And, and in a way, yeah. Oh. Think, think, think about how, how even religion uses sex to control people and try to get them to conform into a very, a very, very specific lifestyle. It's you know, they're saying, well, you simply have to live this way. You have to do this, and you have to, of course, marry her first. You have to do all of these. You have to do X, Y, and Z before you're considered to have a legitimate relationship. And really, the, the marriage aspect is just mm -hmm. one big ritual so that everybody is okay with the person that you're fucking now. And since you've, you've gone through this elaborate ritual, you're like, okay, God's now on, on board with this. God's okay with me fucking with fucking this person for the rest of my life. That's, yeah. 
and my family is too. So, ta da. Well, I mean, it's a, I think it's a recognition. I mean, sex throughout history has had some problematic aspects. I mean, you know, the eight pound meatloaf that you have to take care of for the next 20 years um, is a, is a problematic complication of sex. So, I mean, a lot of this stuff makes sense in the context of a, a society without birth control. You, you really need a family to take care of a kid. Well, I'm saying the, I'm saying the, the ritual is completely, the ritual aspect of it is completely ridiculous if you think about it, because in some societies you basically just got together and started having sex and started living together. And that was it. That was the way things happened. There was no big thing where we have to go ask the gods' permission to go do all this stuff. You just... <clears throat> there, you're married. You fucked, you're married. That's well, it. Well, part of that is, I think, a, I mean, this is really getting into it places, but, I mean, I think that a part of that is trying to, uh, trying to deal with the fact that as we become more dense, like, as we... we live in larger and larger population centers, it becomes more and more difficult to avoid not, you know, not having sex with someone who's not your partner because you're, you know, it, in our evolutionary history, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a fertile human probably encountered what, you know, six other potential mates. And then you go into it to tribes and that increases, you know, tenfold. And then you go into a, a town and you could encounter 600. And now how many do you encounter in one day? that you could potentially have a kid with. So it's almost like you need this terrifying God figure to, to sort of make it all hold together. And that's not, not necessarily that you, that it's makes sense now, but it sort of made sense in the context of the societies we're talking about. Anyway, uh, I, I see Brian has texted his name, so I shall cede the floor unless. I, oh, uh, the only thing I was going to comment on here talking about how powerful sex was and, the only thing I was going to add in is is that uh, sex is the most powerful thing uh, in the planet for us humans. I mean, it's like basically it's how we got here. And not just like through my mom, but I mean like, you know, the universe fucked itself silly before us to be to be here. Um, if we are to accept evolution as we know it. So it stands to reason that, you know, it's it, sex is it is the most powerful force in our culture, in all cultures. Um, whether and how we use it, you know, it, and uh, I think it can't it, it, because of that power, you know, in the wrong hands, you know, going into like superhero speech, um, it can be used for ill. So, and Orgasmo has a lot to say about that. And I, I, I really, I enjoy it too. I haven't seen it in a while, but um, I remember liking it quite a bit. I wanted to speak to one thing. Um, you guys were talking earlier about uh, families and everything. One one aspect uh, that might have influenced marriage in some cultures is the fact that extended families did live together. There were some cultures where um, your pers prospective partner was your family's prospective housemate, at least for a number of years. So getting that approval might have been part of that. All right. I think we should move on, though, because we don't have that much more time, and we have two more topics. So, shall we do Matrix? I don't. Did it, did anyone write Yay. anything? Matrix? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Uh, apparently, there was miscommunication, but it's okay. We're gonna be fine. Those yes. of you, yeah, for those of you who don't know, this wonderful cyberpunk fantasy. I think it's cyberpunk. Would you would you consider it cyberpunk? We're outside of our Matrix right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we're we're outside of our. But you know, it's okay. We'll keep this on point. The wonderful cyberpunk fantasy overall ends up talking about the story of the hacker Neo, who basically finds out that he is actually the world's messiah, <laughs> and he's a hack, uh, the hacker messiah. So basically, he is like Superman Jesus. And <laughs> I want to take issue with something before we continue. I don't know if it's that great overall. I think if you just watch the first movie. You're 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 golden, but do not watch the other two. Yeah. Don't. Oh, for sure. No, no. The I'm Matrix. Sure. Don't ever do it. Just the first one. <laughs> just That's the it. Matrix. There is no other but the first. I, I watched there one and no a half Matrix movie. movies before I stopped watching the Matrix movies. Well, wait. One exactly Matrix? one and a half. <laughs> wait, the Matrix and the Animatrix, guys. The Animatrix is is completely golden. It is fucking amazing. It yeah. it really does wonderful things for the expanded universe. 
Um, it talks about the politics of how things got to be where they are. Um, it, it really explores that sort of sense between what is dream and what is reality. It's it's really great. So, and do it. Says, there Watch is it. No sequel. Yeah, there, there is no. <laughs> there's, there's so many ph philosophical things going on about this. With you know. Well, the problem with the, I think the problem with the sequels is that they took the philosophy and instead of winding it into the plot in an intelligent way, they just sort of pooped it out their mouths in in dialogue. Does does that work or is that just gross? I would have appreciated it more if they explored that expanded universe a lot more. I mean, instead of exploring all the all the shit with Neo and and his new gang and them doing the same old shit they did in the first movie. What they could have done is that they could have explored all of the stuff going on with other people who are doing the exact same thing, but sort of explore that, you, you know, all all the ins and outs, all of the that weird those weird situations that come about when that universe no longer plays by the rules, when they can easily be broken in different ways. So it's there's so many things that they could have done with other movies, and they just didn't. It's a missed opportunity. It's so sad. Well, the Animatrix found some of those opportunities. Well, yeah, I'm saying with um, the sequel. In fact, that could have been the sequel. They could have handled the others in in a different, in that exact same way. Yeah, sort of. Uh, the movies are a lot more restricted, I suppose, mm. or a lot less, or whatever. Well, I, I don't know. It was the info dumps, the philosophical info dumps. They didn't integrate it into the plot in an intelligent way, so it just felt really top heavy. But Brian is trying to squeeze his way in here. Oh, uh, no, it's okay. I thought that's, you know. Okay, so uh, The Matrix, um, I agree. The first movie is the best one. Honestly, I, I think that uh, it was intended to just be a single film, and the Wachowski siblings probably didn't know it was going to be as hugely successful as it was. Um, and so they probably felt pressure from the studio to make more Matrix films. I don't know if you remember, but there was actually an entire marketing bye-bye-bye uh, campaign surrounding the sequel movies because there was like um, the the Animatrix and there were the sequel Matrix movies and there was a video game called Enter the Matrix that was tied to it and there was another one called The Path of Neo and they were all supposed to uh, add more to the, the universe. They were trying to make it Star Wars big. And I think they were trying to do it in too short of amount of time and didn't really think it through. And they kind of like missed the mark on all of the philosophical stuff that the original movie touched on so brilliantly and so well that they were just, you know, like, uh, like uh, Allison said, they were just spitting shit out of their mouths. That by the time they got to the third movie, they were like, that was so awful. I can't believe I went to the theater for that. Actually, you know... It's me. It went much the same way as Heroes, didn't it? <laughs> I don't know. I never, I never even started Heroes because I was like, well, that looks like yep. crap. <laughs> there you go. Same way as Matrix. <laughs> yes. So, but um, I what I really like about the Matrix is, I mean, one of the things that I find really interesting is how it the the whole red pill thing is sort of like where you know this the way that we look at it and talk about it in, in today in that context and and how much there is how many parallels there are to draw about seeing like the world as it was fed to us versus the world as it, you know, when you like pull the curtain back and uh, that's sort of the thing about it that I really, uh, that I think makes it so strong, you know, it, it's so I really love that. Uh, um, Rachel, did you, or Allison, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I actually don't, it was really short. Um, I don't actually remember the last two movies. They just sort of slid off the plate of my mind um, onto the floor and and then desiccated and were swept up by the janitor. And I it just... Was, yeah. They were awful. Yeah, it was, it was like, wonder, so awful. It was just so, like, there's... If you don't have any dramatic tension, what the hell is there to remember? And there, I'm going <laughs> to... There was one thing about The Matrix that I hated, though. One thing. I guess it really it really just made my eyes roll hard was all the stuff that Neo was going through, all the things that he was learning, all the, you know, um, all of the, the stuff about bending the rules and, you know, and, and the agents and all of the mythology and all of the, the him being the one and everything else. And it all culminates to him 
needing to know that Trinity loves him before he gets the power to win. That was the thing that kicked it, you know? And I was like, what? The power of love? I mean, like, <laughs> that's basically because that's what how it culminates at the end. The um, And that was the one thing that I was, at least at the time, and I still kind of like him, you know, like he couldn't just have been good enough on his own. Like, he needed her. It, it did seem strong. like it sort of came out of nowhere. But in, in yeah. a way, that's that's what saves it, because it didn't drive the plot or anything. It just, all of a sudden, oh, apparently it's really important that I love you as well. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's sweet. Aww. Well, yeah, I suppose. The Trinity character was actually kind of dull to me, but... Yeah, she was she a Mary was. Sue, right? She, she really was. a Mary was. Sue. She was just good at everything, didn't take lip from anyone. You know, she just never did anything wrong. She didn't have any flaws in her personality. She was just perfect all the time. And it was kind of like, I don't oh, think God. She was perfect. I found her extremely obnoxious. It wasn't until she fell in love and realized she fell in love that she started to soften that I actually cared about her. It was like, oh, God, she's so obnoxious. I mean, she looks good doing this crazy crap. But I didn't, I didn't like her character at all until she fell in love. Then I was like, oh, finally, she's a freaking human being. She was so cold and so, like, dead to everything and such a... So, just, yeah, just really freaking cold. Well, to so, be honest, I, I, I never felt really... I felt like that sex scene was probably one of the most awkward, forced things I have ever seen on camera. Oh it, there, okay, okay, th there was a fact that she was in love or whatever, but that relationship... There was nothing really, there was no reason for them to really love each other except for she's got hero worship because he's the one. There's <laughs> nothing else there. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, well, the, that's the thing... aside from the fact that Keanu Reeves has the acting ability of a, of a dresser. I mean, um... <laughs> what I really, what I, oh yeah, what I really wanted to say, though, was one of the better themes of the movie outside of Love Conquers All, which is complete bullshit, is, <laughs> um, it, you know, it doesn't always conquer everything, but yeah, the, the, the theme that I liked was there is such a contrast uh, among the machines and everything. Of course, them being cold and heartless, there was a comparison um, that they, they, on the one hand, were representing that sort of order, but that sort of uh, very authoritarian position where you absolutely have to live your life this way. You have to do this. You have to get a job. You have to do all of these specific things for you to be considered to be useful to society. Whereas on the other end, they considered him useful just for being him. So that's, that's the thing. It's very, it's two very different philosophies about human value. Mm -hmm. One of them sees as this very nihilistic idea of humanity it's there's we have no meaning we have no value whatsoever even for being human or even for being living organisms we are a disease whereas on the other end it is we you know we value you for just being a human being and that is uh it's it's a really big contrast and you see that because on the one hand, you have the Agent Smith side. Even before you knew that they were robots and all those other... Not robots, but machines and stuff like that. And that they were computer-generated and stuff like that. They very much represent that kind of societal idea. That you are basically less than nothing unless you play by those rules. Unless you buy into the politics of it. Unless you pretty much sell your soul. And on the... Yeah, it's, it's sort of... But yeah, I enjoyed that aspect. Uh, well, a lot of different aspects. It was great. Did you yeah. know that? Um, uh, did you know that um, Agent Smith, uh, the actor, I forget his name right now, mm -hmm. um, Hugo Weaving, based his performance for Agent Smith on Carl Sagan. So when really? he speaks, yeah, when he speaks, listen to Carl Sagan do any of his shows, and you know that's where Agent Smith got his. Um, like his the, how he chose uh, Agent Smith to speak, it's very good. It's he he nails it really well. If you take Carl Sagan and remove the Kermit, you pretty much get Agent Smith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you if you remove uh, the the him being sort of this wonderful scientist, also kind of you know hippie pothead, you get Agent Smith. It's like what if you took you basically sold Carl Sagan's soul away? <laughs> it's sort of. Check out all the nice so things. Yes. Yes. Yeah, wow, that's that's an entirely different thing to think about in itself. It's true. 
How if to you... turn one person into another person by subtracting a Muppet. A Muppet. Yeah. No, I wouldn't say subtracting a Muppet. I would say subtracting his awe for the universe. He, Carl Sagan was, he, he yeah. stood it in awe of the universe. He, he loved it. He was amazed by it. But when you remove that, when you re- remove that sort of a sense of excitement about the planet and about all of the living organisms, and instead it's there with disdain and hatred for those exact same things, you get H- Which just <laughs> goes to show you, we all need a spirit Muppet. Yeah. Which moves us on to Anita Sarkeesian. <laughs> she needs a spirit Muppet. That might improve her. I don't, I don't know. Maybe about... she has one, a spirit Muppet. No, no, she no. Has to that get one... Anita, you have to subtract all the Muppets and add two gremlins. Ah. Uh, ah, uh, yes. I'm probably... Well, wait, no. What she has is a spirit feeble. <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm, That's what I'm... she's got. She's got... <laughs> Possibly the uh, Siamese cat that seduces the, 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 the theater manager, the walrus. <laughs> uh, for anybody who doesn't know, Meet the Feebles is uh, by... Uh, oh, my God, uh, you're bringing that up. The, uh, the, uh, the, the um, uh, Hobbit and... Um, Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. It's just so <sighs> horrible. So freaking! Well, I love that. I love that movie, but I had no idea you went into that. But my spirit Muppet would probably be Ernie, like of Bert and Ernie, because they're they're sort of like, you sort of fun loving and pissing everybody off. Because like, hey, we're just gonna suddenly wake everybody up in the middle of the night with a herd of sheep. The song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're we're talking about Anita. Anita with the spirit oh, Muppet. I think he, she's either that Siamese cat or the lizard that's addicted to heroin. <laughs> Anita? Anita? Maybe, maybe their love child. Yeah, and and Macintosh, I think, would be the uh, the the porn director. Nice. <laughs> I love John Snow. <laughs> oh, 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 that reminds me. Uh, uh, for Halloween, I came dressed as Columbo, because dressing as Columbo requires a full Macintosh. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is over. I'm declare. This podcast has not begun, and I'm declaring it over. This is not a podcast. The internet has not been invented, and I invented the internet. <laughs> okay, okay, nobody go full Macintosh here. It's, it's, <laughs> I think we just experienced it. Don't you know that podcasts are sexist against women? <laughs> uh, this is uh, not a podcast. <laughs> this is a vulva cast, and it's not a cast. It's a vulva enveloping. That's where the term <laughs> echo chamber comes from. Uh-oh. <laughs> Language is an illusion. <laughs> Nothing can escape the the womb of silence. <laughs> Not a cone. It's a so womb. The womb of silence. Oh my god! What is what is that even? Silence. <laughs> Let's get back on topic. Oh my okay. god. Okay. Now, now, now I'm gonna read. Um. Anita's rapey Christmas carols. Anita Sarkeesian's 2011 video, Top 5 Creepy Christmas Songs, which details the horrors of tropes in Christmas music, has been making the rounds again recently, reminding us all that it'll be very sexist of us to enjoy any cheerful, relaxing holiday songs this year. I'm sorry, I'm having allergy troubles. Uh, You don't have to be an anti-feminist to see the ridiculousness of that video, as YouTuber Chris Johnson demonstrated in a vlog reading of her letter to Feminist Frequency shortly after the top five video came out. And that link is in in the uh, Badger Pod Nerdcast 13 entry in in the uh, Honey Badger Brigade blog. Um, A lot of what I'd have to say about top five creepy Christmas songs is covered in Chris Johnson's video, but there are two other points I would bring up. I take issue... With the feminist freakout over Baby It's Cold Outside, Sarkeesian's video, along with several other feminist sources, have proclaimed the song to be about date rape. Written in 1944 by Frank Lesser and uh, originally performed with his wife, Lynn Garland, at parties, the song and dance routine, and it was always a song and dance routine, not just a song, was a portrayal of a couple flirting. A 2010 Salon article titled In Defense of Baby It's Cold Outside described the scene as follows. It's late in the evening in winter, approaching the time it would no longer be socially acceptable for them to be alone. She laments the social mores that would tarnish her image should she stay too late, 
he provides possible excuses for her to use with her family, including, of course, that it's too cold outside to walk home. Following that is a description of how a misinterpreta misinterpretation of one line in a song has led feminists to mislabel it. According to modern feminists, the singer's female singer's line, Say, what's in this drink? indicates that her drink has been drugged. The back-and-forth flirting in the performance that accompanies the song, however, does not support that. As the Salon article points out, in the context, the line is more indicative of a woman using alcohol as an excuse to engage in behavior for which she would otherwise be harshly judged by others, making the song not about date rape but slut-shaming. At the routine's end, the performance are, performers are in agreement, and the woman chooses to stay. The song is innocent, but the hysteria, hysteria over it and the other four of Sarkeesian's top five is not. It's an example of the way feminists frame information and other factors to falsely infer credibility on their demonization of men. The woman's agency and her choices are totally ignored, while the man's are exaggerated to a superhuman level, as if by the very act of speaking, he has reduced her incapable or he has rendered her incapable of self-determination. The hysteria becomes a melodramatic parody of actual rape, the woman becoming a helpless doll to be manipulated by the evil predatory super dude whose very words pin her in place. As Chris Johnson mentioned in her video, by stretching decidedly unsexist music to fit her perspective, Anita has personified one of her own tropes, the crazy feminist who believes everything is a conspiracy theory. I also find it amusing to see the queen of damseling for dollars basing her accusation against the song Santa Baby on the gold digger trope, as if asking for things is always gold digging. Is everyone who writes a Christmas disc list a gold digger? Further, is Anita Sarkeesian aware that by labeling asking for things gold digging, she has just complained about herself? Between her display of hypocrisy and employment of hyperbole, Anita has wandered into the territory of Poe's Law. She also, uh, um, she also seems to be uh, able to take women and turn them into victims in every conceivable situation and then complains when they're used as a trope, as damsel in distress, and yet she is employing that very trope to give her opinion moral weight. Brian, pipe up whenever you want to. I'm just... It's Crystal's turn. Oh, Crystal, <laughs> so go ahead. Okay, yeah, um, so she's against that song, Baby, It's Cold Outside. Oh, shit. Is that is that's her problem? Now that's one of my yep, that's favorite the number songs. one. That's one of my favorite songs. Every Christmas, I look forward to hearing it on the radio. I think it's the best. All it is is just a playful back and forth. It's flirtation. She clearly wants to stay, you know, and he's you know being seductive. You can't seduce the unwilling. She wants to stay, but she's playing coy. You know, and she's playing with, oh, I don't know, should I stay, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, stay. She wants to stay, but she wants to hear him, uh, like, seduce her is really the bottom line. Because she could stay at any moment, but she's playing the game. I mean, they're having fun. They're flirting with each other. I, I think it's a lovely, sweet song. And it's two people who clearly want to spend time with each other, who clearly have a thing for each other. And, and they're playing. Oh, but heaven forbid, you know, a woman should play with her sexuality, and heaven forbid a man should be seductive, you know, oh, God. Oh, God, I can't. I can't with that thing, that creature. I can't. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, um, it, I, just, I just wanted to add in uh, that I found, of course, you guys, if you go watch the video I did, you know, a little while ago before the show, uh, you will, of course, naturally see that uh, there is no comments. There is no voting. You can't decide whether or not you like it, and you can't talk about it on her channel. So, um, you you know, who knows what people feel, even though I'm pretty sure most people would find it fucking ridiculous. Um, but one thing that I find interesting is in her list, she talks about the song Santa Baby and I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus as um, two, two songs that reinforce... Oh, no, I'm sorry. The other one is uh, All I Want for Christmas is You. And she talks about them as songs that reinforce uh, the the um, and and her argument for male sexual aggression, for rape culture, for um, you know all of these negative male masculinity oriented topics. But this, but when it comes to stuff like um, Santa Baby, it's it's a materialistic trope 
or you know all i want for christmas is you is this the trope of um you know the the idea that a woman needs a man to be happy like all i want for christmas is you so that okay and, and then can, can i ju can i just say and then please after, please after saying that for two minutes she says please tell please tell them what she says brian she says if a man sang it it would also be creepy because oh, it yes. would be bordering nice. on stalkery of course yes because you know that was the biggest head desky people. moment i've ever experienced and i've experienced some head desky moments oh yeah the exact That's same song if sung by a woman yeah. Is a woman needing a man because she's a victim? If sung by a man, is a man stalking a woman? And she's the victim. <laughs> yeah, everywhere, in any situation, she's the victim. It's, and But then when you say feminism promotes the social role of victim for women, they're like, no, we don't. We don't do all right, all right. We don't Mike that. and Rachel, <laughs> your work is cut out for you. Your next parody oh has God. to be a, a, a parody of this song, Baby, It's Scary Outside. <laughs> oh god oh i'll go darker than that i'll think of something oh gosh well well <laughs> well mike if you write it and and you do the lyrics and everything i i will totally sing with you <laughs> we'll you should do an original christmas. christmas honey badger song shouldn't we oh <laughs> there we go <laughs> and the world will cringe <laughs> and the world will cringe <laughs> Oh no, but in you know, like a, a a way that is intentional, I'm assuming, because the oh. it's so horrible. Oh, Not gosh. horribly done, but horribly lyriced. You know what I mean? Oh yes. gosh. Yes, I, yes. I feel like I I feel like I you know, spaghetti should fall out of my pockets now. Um, so so you you finally looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you, Allison? You finally or maybe I knew all along. Maybe you did. And I was just playing dumb. We oh, don't. back to the ages. Wait, wait, wait. I'll be your best. Damn it, James, you have to sing that for people. <laughs> we'll never we'll never get that on the air. It's gonna be too X rated. <laughs> well, we can go I'm, I'm we still like. waiting on Nefanor to finish the lyrics for uh uh the day that 4chan died. Looking yeah. forward to that. Oh yeah, um, yeah, I couldn't get through a minute of uh, Hero Gaming before going rock opera. What's going to happen with American Pie? Come on, Nefanor, finish my, this shit. My, my. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the thing about about all these Christmas carols, the thing about it is, is, these people always find a way to get offended come the holidays, and, and this is coming from me, an atheist. You know, you know, I'm saying I, I'm frustrated when people just start finding any any reason, religious or not. Like, to be offended over things in the holidays. It's everybody's fucking holiday, okay? Stop shitting on it. Try, stop trying to claim it specifically as your own. Just do whatever things make you feel correct. Stop projecting crap like, oh my gosh, this is rapey. Oh my gosh, mommy kissing Santa Claus is about rape. Oh my god. I mean, what about I want a, a hippopotamus for Christmas? Is is How that? How did they get rape out no, of? No, 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 no! I, 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 was, I bet I was she could. I, well, I, no, I, I, yeah, I know, but I'm saying like, how are how are they gonna find like some? Well, here's the thing. Well, I could I could probably <laughs> pretend to be. is a euphemism for a penis. For the oh, no, no, or, hippo or, penises. Or, <laughs> or or the hip or the hippopotamus is is like a metaphor for the patriarchy and pa patriarchal oppression. Or <laughs> if a guy singing sings it, no, he's singing about a fat chick. Surely the elephant is, is is the symbol for the patriarchy. The hippo would be, if anything, okay. I won't go down that avenue. Yeah, yeah. let's let's. Uh, I think uh, we we probably should wrap it up because. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's thanks Christmas. everybody for for listening. Uh, cr Christmas, cr yeah. Christmas in October. People are going to be so pissed because this was supposed to be spooky. Do some spooky. Just, just... Woo! It is spooky. Have you, have you seen her? Kill all men, but feminism doesn't hate men. But but kill all of them, all of them. That's not hatred. Yeah. That's liberating men to be reincarnated as women. Spoon, oh spoon, my gosh. Okay. Are, all right. Uh, thanks, Is that guys. spooky? Is that a spooky uh, thought? I guys, are, are, are we ending? Are we are, are we ending now? Yes, but uh, before we uh, end it, since since everybody who's listened this far is is a very tolerant person who seems to like our message. Why don't we invite them to, uh, you know, uh, help us spread our message of, of what spookiness, Gender, of, of, vitriol, of, of, vitriol, of, vitriol. 
Evil. Um, I like the word vitriol. Well, well, evil gender equality, basically, yeah. Oh, the evils, evils of gender equality. Yes. The evils the, of gender equality, yeah. So. Oh, the evils of gender equality. I thought you were meaning evil gender equality. Hmm. Which mm. I don't know what would that be. I guess feminism. Well, when I, when I say sarcastic, well, it's it's sarcastic. But it's, it's not really evil. The yeah, shilling. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the the Sarcast- shilling. Chilling gender equality. Anyway, we're, our message, our evil message of true gender equality that actually includes men instead of just assuming that everything is fine for men no matter what happens and that that attitude won't actually lead you to blow way past equality into supremacy because you will never look at the other side. Um, and now I'm ranting, but anyway, um, if you want to help us spread that message and also be silly at the same time, please consider... Uh, donating to us on our patron page that is uh, patreon.com with an E I don't know why they did that but they did slash honey badger radio and uh, that goes to promoting the site promoting the message um, you know and I, it's, it's, it's a nice message because you, you can listen to us and you know that we won't start cackling about some horrible act of misandry like cutting off a guy's privates <laughs> And some, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm not even go there. That's that's not even spooky. That's just horrible. Somebody save me from myself, please. I don't want to keep talking like this because I feel like an idiot. Anyway, Carl, that kills people. Patreon, do it. Yes, honey badger. <laughs> busker chicks, folks. This is what busker chicks sound like. Do the Patreon. Do it <laughs> hard. <laughs> Come on here, guys. Guys, guys, guys. Dance. Calm down. Calm down. No, I'm not gonna calm down. Oh, uh, no. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, sorry. Okay. All right. I think right. I think I think James has ended it. 